Good evening, everyone. And thank you so much for joining us this evening. Like most of you, I am really looking forward to the day when we can have conversations like this one, like the one we're having tonight, but have it in person. Um, in the meantime, though, I am grateful for you joining us virtually. Since the start of the pandemic, our series of virtual public programs have allowed us to engage directly with you and the rest of our volunteers, visitors, and supporters in really meaningful ways. And for that, even though we've had a really difficult year, we're thankful for that opportunity. At this critical juncture in time, we are hosting a much needed conversation between two experts in landscape conservation and climate change. And I know some of you might be wondering what what do landscape conservation and climate change have to do with managing and protecting the Appalachian Trail? In short answer, um, everything. And to understand why, I want to just take a minute to go back to the original vision for the AT. As you know, those of you who have been following us along uh, through the last year or so, we've been talking a lot about the fact that 2021 is a really special year, marking the 100th anniversary of Benton Mackay's visionary essay, An Appalachian Trail, A Project in Regional Planning. That essay, which dreamed of not only a footpath, but an entire realm spanning the length of the Appalachian Mountains, identified a range of values. And chief among them was oxygen. And I wanna quote Mackay directly, and um, he said, the oxygen in the mountain air along the Appalachian skyline is a natural resource and a nat national resource that radiates to the heavens its enormous health giving powers with only a fraction of a percent utilized for human rehabilitation. Here is a resource that could save thousands of lives. At no time did those words ring truer than in 2021 when climate change puts our very lives and the very sources of life, air, water, and land at risk. Building and managing the Appalachian Trail footpath is only a partial fulfillment of Benton Mackay's vision. To realize his dream fully, we have to look beyond that footpath. Because beyond the footpath lies the landscape and the trail's natural resources. Landscape conservation, which has for many years been a critical strategy priority for us, will absolutely define the next century of AT management and protection. We know from science and from decades of doing the work that conserving a large landscape like the AT corridor, the largest contiguous green space on the East Coast, could play a significant role in climate action. Keeping the forests along the AT intact and healthy serves two purposes. First, it helps to mitigate the impacts of climate change. And second, it helps the entire ecology of the AT adapt and remain resilient as the climate warms. From species migration to carbon storage, the forests which dominate the AT landscape will be vital in an era of climate change. Today we are joined by Charles, Charlie Chester and Harvey Locke, who will introduce themselves shortly to dive deeper into this critical conversation around large landscape conservation and climate change. We are enormously grateful to them for offering us their time and expertise in, for advancing this urgent issue. The discussion we have tonight is the first of many conversations the ATC will host around climate action. We urge you to follow along and engage with the Conservancy in this work. Lastly, before we start, I would like to express my gratitude to you as supporters of the AT who make this work possible. Your volunteers who every day make Mackay's dream possible, and to our partners in the AT Landscape Partnership, who have played a key role in ensuring the AT corridor remains protected now and for generations to come. So I'm going to turn this over to Charlie and Harvey, and, and they'll be introducing themselves. But I just want to take one more moment and share that when we went through the practice run for this, um, I realized that both Charlie and Harvey were going to have bookcases as their background. So I uh, reoriented the camera in my office tonight to uh, share with you a picture of my bookcase so that we, even though virtually separated, can at least feel a little bit like we're all together having this conversation. So Charlie, I'll leave it to you now to take on the, the rest of the conversation. Great. Well, thank you, Sandy. Thank you for having Harvey and me to talk with you and with 
uh, all of the ATC folk. We we know we know about you. We know all the things, the great work that you do, and it's a real treat and honor for us to be with you. And just also a side note, I want to thank all the people at ATC who've been working so hard to put this on. All the stuff that goes on in the background. Uh, we really appreciate the hard work. So. Um, all right, so I'm going to start just telling you a little bit about myself. Uh, my name is Charlie Chester. I teach global environmental politics at Tufts University and at Brandeis University. My courses are uh, fondly entitled Global Bummers 101. Uh, as outside of academia, I am the chair of uh, an organization that works on bat conservation. Uh, it's called Bat Conservation International or BCI. And I always tell my students when I'm lecturing to them, if, if, you, if you need something to do, if, you want to, if you're a multitasker, try and count the bats behind me. There's a lot of bats. So that's, that's a, something that you can do. Um, a, a little bit more about me. I, I run a website that was recently named earthweb.info. So just a, a, a source of uh, environmental information on the web. And then getting back to uh, getting around to tonight's topic, I was involved for a very long time and I'm still involved. With, a, with an initiative called the Yellowstone to Yukon Conservation Initiative, or Y2Y, Yellowstone to Yukon, Y2Y for short. Uh, I, got, uh, I got into it, the subject of that, because I was studying transborder conservation for my dissertation back, uh, back in the age of the dinosaurs. And I was looking at US-Mexico efforts to protect biodiversity and US-Canadian efforts to protect biodiversity. And I ran into uh, a fellow named Harvey Locke, who was giving a, a, a talk in Bozeman, Montana. And I, uh, I, I said that Yellowstone to Yukon thing sounds like something I, I could spend a great deal of time studying. Uh, and so I, I got to know uh, Y2Y -Y through Harvey and I ended up, uh, uh, he was uh, an interview subject for me uh, when I was writing my dissertation. And then I joined the board of Yellowstone to Yukon and today I'm uh, the chair of the Yellowstone to Yukon uh, Council. So that's, um, that's it for me. Uh, now I wanna introduce, uh, introduce Harvey. Um, I'm gonna give Harvey somewhat of a slow reveal tonight. Harvey is a storied conservationist in Canada and internationally. He's worked both, I've seen him working on the ground, doing conservation easements at the you know, 50 acre, 70 acre level. And he's also working at the global level with organizations such as IUCN, the International Union for the Conservation of Nature and Natural Resources, and the, the uh, Biodiversity Convention. So, so Harvey's uh, got a large spectrum of uh, conservation work that he's done. And rather than give you the standard bio, I'm going to be asking him, I've got a, a set of questions here for, for him. And, and uh, I'm, going to I'm going to throw him some curveballs. We, we, we've discussed the questions, but uh, what we thought we'd do is we would um, pretend that we'd been out uh, on the day, the first day of our hike across, uh, up the Appalachian Trail. Uh, a year ago at this time, my niece got on the Appalachian Trail and we said, thank God she's on the trail because then she doesn't have to worry about COVID. How little did we know that she would be pulled off the trail and she never got to finish. Uh, in fact, she hardly got to start the, the trail last year. So uh, sort of in honor of her, uh, Harvey and I are sitting at the ca our campfire after our first day, and we're we're uh, we're shooting the breeze about conservation. So, uh, so Harvey, how you doing? Very well, thanks, Charlie. All right. Well, we're we're going to be covering a, a lot of ground metaphorically today, and I want to I want to start with this question. Tell me about your experience with the Appalachian Trail. Which parts have you been on? Where have you been on the Appalachian Trail? Well, I've seen pieces of it. I've, I've been on Klingman's Dome. Um, I've been uh, in the Mount Lafayette area and Franconia Notch in New Hampshire. I've been to the top of Mount Washington and I've been to Katahdin. And I've even been on the stretch that's called the International Appalachian Trail by some, which is the idea of extending the trail into Quebec, the Gaspé Peninsula and the Shikshok Mountains, which is a lovely area. So I know a little bit about it and um, I've also had the pleasure of when I was living in New England, studying at Fair Mount and reading that report of Benton Mackay's that was referred to in the introduction. Yeah, well, I'm gonna be, so I'm gonna be jumping around a little bit, but um, I wanna start with you know, later in your career, you spent a few years in the late 1990s, early aughts in Boston, working for a foundation that worked on, on conservation on the East Coast. And the Appalachian Trail was a part of that. 
uh, you were you were here for three years. Just tell us a little bit about more about that experience of of being in the Boston area and working with conservationists in this region. Yeah. So as an outgrowth of that Yellowstone to Yukon work that you mentioned in the introduction, um, and we'll get back to that. I was you know lucky to be invited to come work at the Henry P. Kendall Foundation in Boston by a mutual friend of ours, Ted Smith. Um, and uh, he said, you know, would you please work with people here to see if something comparable to the Yellowstone Yukon idea might be a possibility across the Canada US border and the Appalachian Mountains as they're called in the north, the Appalachians in the south. But, um, and I learned that, for example. <laughs> um, but anyway, the, so that was fun and I got quite involved and I sort of my theory of learning about stuff is to go out and see it. So I went out in the landscape and spent a lot of time poking around and uh, um, seeing sort of what is, and I like to read about the history of ideas and then before I get involved. And I kind of became enchanted with the Appalachian Trail as a concept and as a really strong unifying idea across states and across a landscape about there's something bigger than the pieces. There's a, there's a greater whole that makes uh, some greater than the parts. And the Appalachian Trail is just a super example of that. And as a, as a sort of a spinal column that could on which landscape conservation could hang always appealed to me as an idea. And of course, since you know that time, there's the Great Smoky Mountains National Park, which is a you know a 20th century park, not a 19th century park, the Shenandoah National Park, and then the Blue Ridge Parkway, which some things have happened there. And then Mount Katahdin State Park is also a good thing. So there's been a lot of conservation done in association with the trail. And I know that's not an exhaustive list, but significant things. Yeah. Um, and I always thought, you know, it's a neat organizing principle for, for a large landscape vision that, that that sort of whole thing comes together, enjoying it, using it, protecting it, admiring it, and just knowing that it's there. So it makes you feel good to know there's something like that out there. Yeah. Well, I, I just wanted to bring that up here at the start, and we're going to circle back around in our conversation back to the Appalachian Trail. But I want to now take us back. Uh, take me back to your childhood, Harvey, and your live growing up in the province of Alberta, uh, which is a very different place uh, when you were a child. And uh, you know, just tell us about what you know your experience as a native Albertan and how you ended up in the in doing. You know, as a lawyer, you became a lawyer, and how did you end up in the field of conservation? Well, when I was a kid, um, my parents are both from a place called Banff in Banff National Park in Canada. So I grew up in the nearby city of Calgary, where my family's been for a long time in this valley. And um, we went to Banff all the time and hiking and skiing. And, you know, I had an aunt who lived in town and, and um, I live here now, by the way. Um, but it was sort of, that was what mountains looked like. And it's a pretty wild place, a pretty beautiful place. Um, lots of animals running around still, unpolluted rivers, wild rivers, you know, it's just a pretty cool place. And I sort of thought that was what mountains are. And then when I finished high school and went to college for my first year in the Swiss Alps, I was like really surprised that the Swiss Alps were very beautiful. I had good skiing, but they didn't have any wildlife. And there was no free flowing streams the way I knew it. The, the little lake that we were taking on a hiking trip to was just a little pond that had been dammed to some fish stuck in it. And I'm like, wow, this is really different. And I lived there for a whole year and never saw anything wild bigger than a snail came out after a spring rain once. And I'm like, I, you know, this is quite concerning to me. Like, this is not what I want to have happen back home. And so at that young age of sort of right after high school, I sort of said, you know, this should not happen where I'm from. And that sort of set the path that I'm on that, you know, brings me to this conversation today, which is uh, some 45 years later. Yeah. Well, so, so you, you came back, you, you finished college and you went to law school and you became a lawyer. Uh, tell us about your experiences as a lawyer working with conservation organizations in Alberta. Yeah, so I got involved volunteering with an outfit called the Canadian Parks and Wilderness Society and ended up becoming the national board chair president type. Um, and I did grassroots work and then sort of expanded to a national agenda. And then through that time, uh, you know, the environmental law was born in the United States with a case called Sierra La Club and Morton in the late 1960s. It was born in Canada in about 1989 with a case called the Rafferty Alameda Dam. And so I happened to be a lawyer at that time when it was sort of opened up and it all has to do with what's called standing. You know, you have the citizens have a right to engage in environmental law. That's really why it's called the birth. And 
so because I had an interest and I had relationships with people, I ended up getting some of the cases that were some of the earliest environmental law cases in the country. Um, and I ended up doing a lot of cases involving big projects proposed for ecosystems, like big golf courses or resorts or whatever, or oil and gas wells proposed for a wild area. And I started working with biologists a lot. And to, to do your job properly as a lawyer, you have to learn what the witnesses are going to say, uh, both on your side and the other side. And so you have to read and learn. And son of a gun, if I didn't start to read and understand it and get interested in it, and I got deeper and deeper into it. And I started to think, this is really cool. And then as I got further and further into it, I got more and more engaged. And then I started to have my own ideas. And son of a gun, if some people didn't get interested in my ideas. So, and here I am now where I actually am called Dr. Harvey Locke with an honorary science degree. And I spend most of my time um, working in this, this space of publishing papers and arguing science and having chats like this, even though my undergraduate training's in an arts and, uh, and I'm a, a law degree, but <laughs> so it's a weird world. Life evolves in a strange way. Well, Harvey, you've had a lot of, of interesting, great ideas in your career, but one of them stands out uh, and that's Yellowstone to Yukon. And uh, you know, it was, it was about 1993, if I remember correctly, that, that uh, you were camping in the Wilmore Wilderness Provincial Area. And uh, you know, tell us about that experience. So um, this, these cases I mentioned earlier, where I'd been working on these projects, they started to have a similar pattern about them. So I did one in the Bow Valley here, and then I did another one further south, just north of Glacier Park in Southern Alberta. And it was all the same issues with the same concerns. And I'm like, there's a pattern here. And then the summer of 1993, I did a big walk, a 16 day walk across the Wilmer Wilderness Park, which is a big area north of Jasper Park, a million acres, fantastic. And then I went from there to a place that we call the Northern Rockies in Canada, which is actually a lot further north than what you call the Northern Rockies. And I was out with a guy named Wayne Sawchuk and um, his partner at the time. And, and we were sitting by a campfire um, and caribou going past the campfire and so on. It was really cool. And I'm like, this is so much like the same areas further south, except it's very, very wild. And so this idea of, that I'd kind of been exploring a bit about thinking about Yellowstone and the same landscape, same species kind of thing and how it connects up all the way up the mountains. So I started scratching out on the side of a map, this idea of a Yellowstone to Yukon biodiversity strategy, talking about linking up all these areas. And, you know, this wasn't sort of like a Moses moment where I had this sudden divine revelation. It was more, there was a lot of ideas out there about the need to connect up parks for wildlife. It was an initiative called the Wildlands Project, which was promoting a continental vision for conservation. But this idea of thinking about how Yellowstone connects all the way up to the Yukon was a function of going into these remote wild places and realizing that it didn't really stop just from in the national parks like Banff, Jasper, and Yellowstone. It actually went much further. And so the consequences of it was this sort of idea. Um, and then we had an initial organizing meeting where we brought people together who didn't know each other from the two countries. And, uh, you know, it was really fun doing that. And I sent out a little discussion paper based on that article on the map and people said, yeah, this makes sense, but we need to add this and go further north and further south and a little bit more west. And yeah, but this is a good idea. So off we went. And now, you know, it's, it's kind of fun that Yellowstone Yukon has become an idea that, you know, a lot of people have heard of now. And yeah, uh, yeah. that is actually making an impact on the ground too, um, which I'm really happy about. That yeah. A big idea, a big vision has an impact on the ground and, you know, nobody could you know, look at what Benton Mackay did. We're still talking about him 100 years later. It's a kind of a similar kind of space, yeah. right? That's right. So, so just looking back, so going back in the historical record here, at that time, you know, the things that people were talking about were island biogeography theory and looking at islandization of habitats and the potential threat of that. To what degree was, was the, the, the ideas of connectivity large landscape conservation and then climate change you know in the late 90s when you were when you were very active in all of this were the how big were those ideas well you know it was really interesting um, because i'm from where here um you know the first time i went to yellowstone park 1978 i'm like oh my god this is similar to where i'm from i had no idea it would be so similar or feel so similar and then I started looking at some prehistory stuff and you know arrowheads from the obsidian cliff in Yellowstone were being traded as far north as Edmonton, Alberta, which is north of where I am. And so there was this historic human use of the landscape. And then I read this fantastic book by a woman named E.C. Pilu called After the Ice Age. 
And she described how when the ice, is, the ice melted off North America from the Wisconsin Ice Age, the big glaciers, um, how life rebounded and it just went north-south naturally. You know, they've, the stuff just moved north. And this is a wonderful book to read. And I'm like, okay, this is neat. And then I read about this island biogeography stuff, this idea that parks that become surrounded by hostile landscapes, hostile meaning totally cultivated, totally logged, totally mined or covered in houses or whatever, just become little islands. And then they start to lose their species because the animals can't get to find their mates. And you put that all together and then you, you take it to a place like this idea of Yellowstone and Yukon. And for many years, I worked in the tourist office in Banff when I was in university. And tons of visitors were driving from Yellowstone to the Yukon and on to Alaska. That was a standard summer route in the late 70s because the idea of the Alaska Highway was very important in, to the war generation, Second World War generation. It was this road built through the wilderness to, in case there was an invasion of Alaska. So the road was built by the US Army across Canada with Canadian cooperation. So all of that was just sort of in the ether, in the culture. It was in the science, it was in the prehistory, it was in the present history. Yellowstone's the oldest national park in the world. Banff is the third oldest national park in the world. Water and Glacier on the border is the oldest peace park in the world. And then this wild area of the Northern Rockies and so on. And just the idea of weaving all that together just really struck me as cool. So it all kind of landed. And then, you know, I like to think in terms of resonant ideas and, Yellowstone means national park and Yukon means wilderness to people. So that worked as an idea and son of a gun if it didn't catch on. <laughs> well, as, as why do I over time became widely noted and it started getting picked up by a lot of people in the conservation world and then slowly outside of the conservation world, even the mainstream media started to see Yellowstone to Yukon as a thing. As as that happened in Yellowstone to Yukon got, it would caught on as, as this idea of large landscape conservation. Um, how did that influence your thinking at a, at a fully continental scale? So thinking North America, and then beyond that, how did that affect your thinking about conservation globally? Well, you know, the, you start with, um, there's a funny line that I like, uh, to the hammer, everything's a nail, right? So. You start thinking that what you're used to is what normal should be. And one of the first things I learned when I moved to New England is what, what I knew wasn't the same thing as what New England was. And whereas in my part of the world, preserving intact wild places is still a very important thing to do because we still have big chunks of de facto wilderness, some of which aren't even protected yet. We have some damaged areas, but mostly it's kind of in that large wild continuum um, landscape. I moved to New England and I'm reading the land history and son of a gun of New England actually is in better shape in terms of forest cover today than it was in the 1840s when it was all cleared, burned and farmed. And so you're like, well, I have to think about this a little bit differently, right? This is not the same thing and it's coming back. And what about species coming back? And whereas I'm sort of from a place where there's still grizzly bears and wolves and all the stuff, um, this is a place that's sort of rebounding. And so how do you think about that? This is different. And so it was part of, you know, you have to understand where you're working and operating. And then, but it was still, you know, you still have the issues of North-South movements, connectivity, you know, all the things that were mentioned at the beginning um, were all true, but they, they're true, and, but your strategies are different. The other thing is in New England, I like to say Massachusetts is a word for many, many land trusts. Um, because Massachusetts doesn't really have a lot of public land. It's all private. Maine is almost all private land. And so how do you do conservation in that setting? I'm used to big blocks of, of provincially owned land or federally owned land, but small parcels of private land you have to work. So you have to think differently about every place you work. And then eventually I came to you know, realize that, that these questions of connectivity and land condition varied. And ultimately through this commission I chair, this position I hold with the IUCN World Commission on Protected Areas, I was given the small task of going out and determining what the scientific consensus should be for how much of the world we should protect with the next global framework for nature in 2020 and to persuade everyone to do it. And so this is kind of a small task. But one of the things that got involved in there was um, talking to people all over the earth and I've traveled a lot around the world. And it turns out there's three basic conditions in the world. There's cities and farms, there's the kind of a shared landscape in between the cities and farms where there's some forestry, some human use, some farming, some grazing, but a lot less dense, smaller towns. 
And then there's these big, large wild areas that still exist. So in the United States, think of Alaska. In the intermediate area, think of Yellowstone or Glacier. And in the cities and farms areas, you know, it's a lot of the United States, Ohio Valley or, you know, places like that or the Piedmont of the East Coast. And that you have to have suites of strategies for each of those. The Appalachian Trail is a classic sort of shared landscape middle environment where you've got pieces that you can piece together and actually do this classic idea of a protected areas with connectivity between them so that you can have all the features in the landscape maintained, you can protect your watersheds and so on. Um, in other places though, to do only that would be a great loss. Like many of the wild places in Northern Canada or the Amazon or the Congo, if you only did that, we'd actually lose a lot. But if you do that in a place like the Appalachian Trail, it's, it's a very, very good thing. And the cities and farms, you can't have the same ambitions you have for the Appalachian Trail. You've got to do this land trust work, replant native species, make sure no endangered species go extinct, ensure urban people have access to recreation. So you have these different goals across these three conditions. And that's turned out to be a pretty robust idea that I'm pleased is getting global interest now. And But the, this corridors of conservation up the, what some people have called the Eastern Wildway or the Appalachian Trail or Yellowstone to Yukon are sort of those classic middle of those three condition strategies. Yeah. So we, we sort of skipped over something that I, I want to backtrack just a little bit because we went right to these uh, three conditions. But you you were involved after, you know, or, or as you were working on the ground with Yellowstone to Yukon as a strategic advisor and, and doing lots of different things with Y to Y, you also started working with an organization called the Wild Foundation and started working on this idea called the Nature Needs Half. And that idea was subsequently adopted under another term, Half Earth, uh, promoted by the famous biologist E.O. Wilson. And so this idea of Half Earth, you know, how, did, how does that fit into sort of the, the evolution of your thinking? Well, you know, at the beginning of my conservation work, you know, again, I mentioned that when you're in your backyard, that's your reality. And then we were sort of promoting Yellowstone Yukon as the last great intact mountain ecosystem. And we, if we restore the connections between Yellowstone and the North, then the bears will be fine. And it's sort of a scarcity mentality, the best of the last. Um, and, you know, that's, you know, more catchy and marketing and so on. But, you know, and then I did the work in New England. I said, well, it's not the same thing, but it's still pretty impressive and still important. And then I started doing global work and um, I actually had a moment with a tiger in a Bandavgar National Park in middle India in Madhya Pradesh province, which means middle province in India. And I was there and I was kind of alone with the, was just in an open air Jeep and this tiger stopped and looked me in the eye and I thought, oh my God, this is every bit as cool as a grizzly bear. And you know, I should care about this as much as I care about the bears that I, you know, so worried about at home. And then I started thinking about global stuff and got more involved globally. And then I realized um, I did a lot of stuff because the Yellowstone Decon got well known. I traveled a lot. I was giving talks in various countries and giving talk in Australia. And, and so there's a funny moment at the very first Yellowstone Yukon meeting, a man named Reed Noss, a famous conservation biologist, said, you know, when you look at all the science, it tends to, in North America, it all tends to say we should be protecting about half of everything. And at the time, our targets were like 10% or 12%. And this is 1993 when Reed said that, and I'd never forgotten it. And then I started reading a bunch of science from all over the world because I was interested. And I kept finding studies from Africa or from India or from, you know, all over the place. And they're all saying around half, around half and around half. But nobody was saying it out loud. It was sort of like, we can't say this because it's kind of bigger than the numbers we've been advocating for. And so I had this really funny experience. I was giving a talk at a, about Yellowstone Yukon at a conference in Australia called Linking Landscape Summit. And it was um, all about things like Yellowstone Yukon and the Appalachians and so on, the Great Eastern Ranges in Australia or the Gondwana Link or whatever. And very similar kind of conversation. And I gave my talk and it went fine, you know, sat down. And then the organizers said, by the way, you're giving the closing keynote at dinner as well. And I'm like, oh. I, I kind of already gave my talk, so, so I, I kind of, what am I going to say? And I've been thinking for a long time about this, and then also about this idea of, you know, the, there was a lot of talk at the time about 360 degrees, uh, 360 parts per million being too much, or 350 parts per million, or 375, and these numbers that were getting circulation around the climate side. And so um, I decided to just walk out this idea of protecting half the world at this dinner party in Australia with all kinds of people from across Australia. And I have friends there. So I thought, well, 
they'll at least be nice to me. So I, I gave the talk and the people really liked it. So that was cool. And then, um, that, so the first foray and then World Wilderness Congress, Wild Nine, Merida, Mexico, a couple of thousand people closing. And you know, I, I, I opened it with the president of Mexico and Wild Foundation organized this thing, a lot of fun. We had a great meeting. And the closing plenary, Vance Martin, who's the president of the Wild Foundation, said to me at lunch on the end day, five days in, our closing keynote speaker didn't get on the plane. What are we going to do? <laughs> and I said, well, I could give this talk. I gave it Australia. And he said, yeah, let's go for it. So I closed the, the, this idea of uh, it's time to protect half the world. Let's just say it out loud. It's time to protect half the world. And son of a gun, there, wasn't a, there was a great response to that. So eventually we got some branding help by a couple of uh, really great guys in Los Angeles and we shifted the name to Nature Meets Half and then that sort of rolled out as this sort of movement, consciously structured as a movement. And then um, a few years later, um, E.O. Wilson um, using a phrase that a guy named Tony Hiss, who's just done a, a book on, on protecting half the world came up with, which was Half Earth, also came out with, with his book on you know, similar kinds of concepts, different methodologies. But at the end of the day, we kind of have this idea at large now in the world that really the science is we should be protecting about half the world, not 10%, not 12%, or not existing global targets like 17%. We need to go a lot bigger if we want to turn this problem around. And so I've been sort of carrying the gospel of nature needs half to the world for some time. And so now I want to ask you something. So now here, here's where we get to the, the where the policy hits the road, and that's this idea of 30 by 30. And that's, that's something that's been adopted by the Biden administration. This is a big deal. So, so, how, did, so how did that evolve? I think this is, this is the kind of uh, information, I think, that people that are working on conservation throughout the Appalachian region, the Appalachian Trail uh, landscape, this is, this is what is really important to know because this is the potential for supportive policy coming from on high. So, so how, did, how did we get to 30 by 30? And what does that mean for the Appalachian Trail? Well, 30 by 30 is an outgrowth of this bigger idea of protecting half the world. And so we have these global targets that, that um, you know, the United States isn't uh, as focused on the Convention of Biodiversity as every other country is. But nonetheless, the United States has robust biodiversity policies and you know, attends as an observer and so on. So it's not irrelevant in any way. But the global target was 10% of the ocean, 17% of the land set in 2010. Well, it's not enough. So we have to change that. So this idea of protecting half the world, a lot of noise made, a lot, a lot of stuff on it, a lot of science, overwhelming amount of science done, showing it's more like half, everybody. It's more like half. And um, at the bottom end of the range of the studies is 30%. And then the, the idea of uh, 30 by 30 is that like the Convention on Biodiversity does decadal or every 10 years a target. So there's a strategic plan right now from 2010 to 2020, 10 and 17% ocean and land. Then what's the next target gonna be? Well, it should be at least 30% by 2030. There's now 57 countries have signed up to that vision called the High Ambition Coalition. Really good job's been done by the WIS Campaign for Nature and uh, National Geographic in promoting that. And, and we have uh, the Biden administration who embedded this idea of 30 by 30 in their climate policy. And Secretary of the Interior Holland also tabled the bill in the House when she was there as a congressperson calling for 30 by 30. And the state of California governor has a policy of protecting 30 by 30. So this is all connected to these ideas. And 30% by 2030 is, is a, a target that pulls us ahead a long way. Um, it's a milestone, not a destination. I hope it's a milestone early enough so we can turn the corner on, frankly, the disastrous stuff going on in the world. I know I, I look happy and smiley, but I'm not unaware that we have some very serious problems out there, which is why we need to way ramp up the scale of nature conservation, way ramp up the scale of climate action, and recognize that they're the same problem. They're two, you know, the climate and nature conservation are the same problem. They're not separate problems. Yeah, the the distinction between those problems is a you know that that's a dividing wall uh, that's as 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 high and as thick as as any other wall in, within the environmental community. How do you get um, how do you get people from 
the, the biodiversity conservation world to start really not just communicating, but working with people from the climate change world. That's, that's a, a stumbling block that has to be overcome. How do you do it? Well, you know, way back in 1992, 92, when the conventions were signed that the U.S. signed about the climate and, and the biodiversity convention came out all from the same meeting, everybody understood that these were interconnected global problems. But as they got professionalized, they sort of drifted apart under these, these communities. And, you know, the reality is that the climate problem is about nature. We don't care if there's 300 parts per million or 700 parts per million in the sky of carbon dioxide. We care about what happens to the climate that then has an impact on nature, which can cause, you know, ice sheets to melt and rise to sea level. They can cause the forest to dry out and have fires. We can have more floods. Um, these are the things we worry about. Well, they're all impacts on nature. And similarly, what we tend to overlook is while fossil fuels are a huge part of the climate problem in terms of what going into the sky, the absorption of, of, of carbon also needs to go on in intact nature. And the storage of carbon goes on in intact nature. And in fact, destroying intact nature releases carbon to the sky and reduces the absorptive capacity. So it's not just a problem about tailpipe emissions. It's a problem about the whole carbon cycle. Protecting lots of nature is the best, easiest, cheapest climate strategy we have, and we have to reduce those tailpipe emissions. And it's not one or the other, it's both now immediately fast, hard, protect at least half the world, meet those targets that are under the Paris Agreement, pull carbon emissions down to carbon neutrality. And so one of the things I'm working on is this idea of also blending that in with human development and a, a new idea of called the equitable nature positive carbon neutral future, where we roll these ideas all together, we come together as a community, also people interested in development and advance this. And uh, a little plug, there's a new TV station devoted to the environment called EarthX TV that's gonna be featuring some of these ideas in and around Earth Day. So for people who care about these conversations, there's a new TV station that's gonna be talking a lot about this that's sort of dedicated in this space, which is pretty cool for us to have. And I think we're out of time. Yeah, uh, we've got some questions from the audience uh, because of the way this is set up. But we, we got these questions beforehand. Uh, these didn't come to us live, but we've had some questions submitted. Um, let me ask you just one very practical last question for me, and then we'll go on to these great questions. But that is um, what you are in the foundation community for three years, and you know the foundation community. What is it that the foundation community, particularly the foundation community working in the Appalachian Trail region, what is it that they can do to get us to an equitable, carbon neutral, nature positive world? What, 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 do, what, what would, would your recommendation be on that end? Well, you know, the Appalachian Trail Conservancy is going to try to conserve more land, support it. That's okay. really a good thing to do. You know, like, let's just be direct, not cut, cut around the block. Um, <laughs> And I didn't get paid to say that. I just happen to think it's real. Other land trusts, you can support them to put this stuff together. Also, you know, this, this idea of thinking about connectivity, that everything needs to be connected so it can move as the climate change, but also it needs to move to find mates. So it's, it's, it's both a climate and just a, a, a nature challenge. So the more the landscape is connected. And then the other piece that I think is really important is that the human connection to nature has come out in the pandemic as a very important issue for people. The solace of nature, that's what Bent Mackay was talking about and all those founders of the Wilderness Society 100 years ago were talking about. Those ideas are back in front of us now. We need to recognize that humans are part of the natural world and need nature, not only to provide a stable climate, water, food, all the things we get, but also to be fully human. And the more we emphasize nature and all of its values at the heart of the human endeavor, the more we'll succeed, uh, the more the Appalachian Trail will be needed and honored. All right, well, thank you, Harvey. Well, let's, let's go, let's just jump into a few questions here. What are the, the most we can get done in, in the next few minutes? Um, so here's, I think here's, here's a question that was picked um, because I think it's on the minds of all of us and that is, uh, I'll just say it, read it directly. Is it too late to do something about climate change or is the renewed focus on initiatives like 30 by 30 giving us hope? Yes, <laughs> giving us hope. Um, and, you know, the, 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 the way to look at this is in 1972, we got our first warnings the world was in trouble. In 1992 at the Rio convention, we knew the world was in trouble and we needed to act. And now we're in a full blown firestorm and we just, have to act. 
in big, urgent ways. I think these goals like 30 by 30, focus, get it done, are what we need. Similarly, on the climate side with the, you know, we're going to get to net zero carbon. We're going to make a transition in how our economy and all of our lives run in relationship to how much fuel we put, carbon dioxide we put in the sky. This is urgent. It's important. It's not too late. To pretend that we haven't already got harm would be a lie. We've got some bad things already underway. This is not a future problem. You know, we're in the we're in the in, in the water up to our knees now, and it's rising, so to speak. But that doesn't mean we can't get out of the swamp and 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 turn around a lot of the problem. But every day we delay, it gets worse. It's not. It's someday we have to act. It's we have to act now. There's hope in acting. And also, the cool thing is, none of us knows the future. We know the trends. The trends are bad. But if we act, we know that our actions can help. And that in and of itself gives me hope. Because if you don't act, you know that you're doing nothing for a problem that's going the wrong way. If you do act, you have reason to feel good about what you're doing, which then makes you feel good about your life. And we can all hope that the future is wonderful, driving towards these unifying visions. All right. Um, so here's another one. If 30 by 30 is successful, what are some of the largest impacts of climate change that we'll avoid? Uh, you know, what, what, what way will we make sure the AT is looking like what we saw in our lives a uh, hundred years from now? Well, it does two things. One is that by keeping nature alive, protecting more of it, you, you keep carbon from getting into the sky, which reduces the problem of climate change in the first place, right? Keeping the carbon out of the sky is the big challenge. Then having systems with older forests, varied stage age forests, which is what the you know, forested environment the Appalachian Trail is, um, you will have uh, more adaptive capacity. So we know that older moister forests retain their moisture better than forests that have holes and stuff cut in them, for, and, you know, checkerboards. Moisture so and keep, carbon. Yeah, keeping, keeping things intact keeps the system more resilient or more adaptive to, to the changing climate. And, but the more we cut it down and, and so on, the more we dry it out, the more the drying effect of climate change causes further problems. So keeping that system intact is really, really important for all the values, including the recreational values. I mean, that's, what, that's what's cool about it. You have this lovely forested, you know, Eastern deciduous forest landscape, which is one of, you know, in the fall, it's one of the most beautiful spectacles on earth. I also happen to like it in the spring when the flowers all pop and the leaves are lime green. I think it's fantastic. Those two seasons are as enchanting as anything in the natural world. And I've seen a lot of the natural world. All right, well, uh, Harvey, here's, here's another one. This is a little more general. Um, just thinking about climate change, what benchmarks or key indicators do you use to keep track of or to understand the magnitude of climate change? And you know, thinking about uh, you know, your, your, your world there in Banff and, and the Yellowstone to Yukon region. Well, it's really easy to know that climate change is real. When I grew up in the city of Calgary, Alberta, you couldn't grow tomatoes because it was too cold in the evenings, even in the summer. And you never went out without a jacket because there was no such thing as a hot evening. Now you can grow tomatoes and there's hot evenings. Um, and the glaciers in the Canadian Rockies, which I have seen in my lifetime, recede hundreds of meters and in some places kilometers with my own eyes. I'm not reading about this, I've seen it. And the tree line creep in our mountains, our mountains are quite high. So there's a thing called tree line where there, you know, the, 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 there's a really visible place where trees don't go higher because the climate's too harsh above that point. The tree line has climbed several hundred feet in my lifetime. And places that were alpine meadows are now being filled in with trees in my lifetime, places I'm really familiar with. So you, you just, it's just real, it's, it's happening now. And so I'm like, what we got to do is stop it happening more. We can't stop what's happened. And there's a lag time even on the stopping. But if we don't get this beast under control, it's going to make profound change that we won't recognize. And where I'm from is a, a dry environment. So if those glaciers all melt off, then we got a problem with all of our rivers in the summer. And if you take like Colorado, which is already very dry, and if the Colorado Rockies and stuff don't hold their snow longer and so on, it has an effect across the huge landscape. And then we, and we'll see desertification march north. And, you know, it's a funny thing in Canada, the Arctic is warming way faster than everything else. And it's just wreaking havoc, the systems. 
there is a part as you get further north, like Minnesota or Canada, where we actually will have a longer growing season. So some people say, hey, well, that's kind of cool. But you'll have a longer growing season with refugees all over the world escaping sea level rise. And all the issues that people are concerned about are just going to get worse and worse and worse. Um, so there is no hiding from climate change. We need to stop it as best we can now. Well, it, it's, uh, you know, it, it, there's, there's no escaping the bleak picture. Um, here's a question that I think uh, that people like you and me need to really pay attention to a lot and, and figure it out. So I'm hoping you can help me here, Harvey, with this one is how can we empower youth and diverse voices to help lead the charge of climate action? Yeah, I really like that. And, and part of it is, you know, there's a phrase that I read somewhere, I'd love to give the attribution, but it goes like this. The job of every generation of parents is to give hope to their children. Well, we've bungled it bad, if you, if you look like me. Okay? We've given our children a future of despair. That's not acceptable. That's not good enough. We have to give a future with a hopeful vision of change. And I think we also, on account of that, need to practice some humility. Young people need a seat not only at the table or to be listened to, they actually should have a hand in shaping with their values the future path that we follow. If we were older and wiser and should just pat them on the head and say, thanks for your input, kiddo, um, then we wouldn't have a world that the climate is changing and there's a biodiversity extinction crisis. We wouldn't have that if we were so wise. We haven't been wise. So we need to empower that. And in terms of the idea of diverse voices, I'm really interested in different worldviews. And you know, it's really interesting if you talk to, and I have been talking to, traditional people with traditional values, whether they be in Africa or China or India or indigenous people on our continent, they all see themselves in relationship with nature that is one of sort of more familial approach where they don't think they're above it and on top of it and managing it and it's there as some kind of a warehouse to exploit. Those traditional values are actually much more, we're in this together with nature, we have a relationship with nature. In some cases, nature is just a member of the family, the other animals and so on. Some people see the whole landscape as animate, like alive. Um, and it's frankly a healthier view than the view we've had, which is, you know, go out, exploit it, bring it to bear, make yourself rich, it'll all be fine because we're impoverishing ourselves now. And we're particularly impoverishing the future by being using the models we've been using and science tells us we're related to nature. Um, our behavior needs to recognize we're embedded in nature, part of it. And then that way we can turn this corner. Um, so I think we've got to be listening a lot better. You know, um, we've had a pretty good run. People look like you and me, but, but we, you know, we're kind of brought things to a bad spot. So we better be doing some listening here. Yeah. And I think the, what I've heard is, is we have to stop thinking about nature as a set of jewels and think of nature as a tapestry. And I, I like that analogy um, or that metaphor. So, um, so let's see. We've got uh, we got five we got five minutes for some more questions. Um, and I've got some more questions here, Harvey. But is there anything that you'd want to you know you again? You've worked in the AT landscape, you know, professionally, and so you know this area. Uh, do you have any things that, that I haven't asked you, or that the audience hasn't asked you? You know, what? What? Just want to make sure you you have a chance to to voice every concern that you you have, and I and, and then we've got a couple more. Well, I think one thing is very cool about the Appalachian Trail is it's a solution already to a problem that we're recognizing. You don't need to create this great vision; you got one. You just need to act on it and and do more of it. And it's like the answer is the answer to the problem is already there. This Appalachian Trail and Landscape Vision, you just need to do more of it. You don't need to invent the new dingy dingy new. Um, you got it. And that's really exciting. And that's part of why I was really pleased to be part of this little session is, you know, you got something cool, double down on it, be proud of it, put it in the window, make it bigger and better and more landscape oriented and and be proud. And it's something you're doing for not only for yourself, but for the whole world, for all the watersheds. It's a great thing. Um, do more of it. <laughs> uh, so uh, I guess we got probably a question, uh, time for another one or two questions. And, and I do want to ask this one, um, just because we're, we're sitting together uh, virtually and we both have lots of books behind us. And obviously, um, you know, I'm, I'm sort of the uh, consummate academic, you're the, uh, the consummate practitioner. Uh, but we both love thinking about ideas and learning. W to what degree is the AT landscape a place 
for research and learning. And you know, for, for learning about climate change, to what degree can we channel resources, uh, educational resources that, that will ultimately enable us to know about this region to solve problems like climate change? Well, I think just, you know, the single, if you do a global scan, what's cool about the Appalachian Trail landscape? The diversity of deciduous tree species. That's extraordinary. And so if everybody developed literacy about the diversity of the tree species in the Appalachian Trail and how they all come together and how, you know, that evolves through time. And, and uh, you know, as you go up in the Smoky Mountains, you go literally, you can see the leaves changing as you go up slope in the spring or in the fall if, in the other direction. I mean, that's an extraordinary thing to, to embrace and to think about. You know, if everybody could see a fallen leaf and know what tree it was, if everybody could understand the sort of cycle and what lives there and, and what's been lost also, like the story of the loss of the American chestnut is a very sad thing, but you can still see American chestnut fence lines and old buildings that, that tell you that, you know, things can change for the worse but they can also change for the better, the story of afforestation or there being more forests now than there were in that area a hundred years ago is a story of hope. And I think what we need is, we don't need a blind hope, we need um, heartfelt hope and we need passion for nature and we need action and we need to demand it. Not This is not a luxury, um, your metaphor of jewels, tapestry, all that. Um, Nature is not the thing we do when we've got lots of surplus. Nature is where we live and we have to honor that and understand that if we don't live in harmony with nature, we're baking ourselves into a very bad situation. And that to me is hopeful. Yeah. Well, Harvey, I wanna thank you for this uh, hour together. It's always a pleasure to talk with you. And, um, I guess we, uh, we're getting, uh, it's, it's 7.55, so I wanna make sure that Sandy has, a, has the opportunity to, to close out. Um, any, I mean, that, that message on hope, that's a great close out, but any other final thoughts? No, oh, it's been fun. Great to chat with you, Charlie, and our modified Appalachian Trail shelters here. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, no, thanks for, for a really great conversation and thanks to the Appalachian Trail Conservancy for the chance to to share some of my passion for your landscape, which I, you know, I have very fond memories of. And yeah, yeah, I, I can't wait. I can't wait to get back out. And I'm hoping my niece, uh, she's in medical school now, and I'm hoping that she gets to someday in her life go back out and do the, do the trail. She will. Sandy. Hi. So Harvey, Charlie, thank you so much. I just. Um, I'm sorry we did not schedule more time because I at least personally could have um, sat here for quite uh, uh, a lot longer and listened to both of you. Um, Charlie, I'd love to be in a classroom with you. Um, you bring such energy. And Harvey, as you were discussing and talking about your trips, I'd love to travel with you sometime, quite frankly. You've had such incredible opportunities and some a lot of the places, including Africa, that you talked about. I've had the, the privilege um, to visit as well, but um, you know, that's been one of the toughest things I think with COVID, right? Especially for th those of us who really do embrace that opportunity to, to go outside of our own backyard and, and see both the differences and the similarities. But I really, really appreciate everything that you both have talked about here tonight and more so just how much you have uh, are contributing to the, the better good of, of our, our world and our country and our countries and um, the work that we're doing, you know, even on that smaller level. But, um, you know, spending your lives in this kind of service is really admirable. So I want to thank both of you for that very much. And um, thank you for what you're doing. Oh, well, you know, I, I want to also, and I took some notes as you were talking tonight, there were a lot of things. I, I think my communication staff are thinking they're just going to start using taglines from some of the comments that you made this evening because they were just so spot on and so to the core of what it is we're trying to do here. And I had some prepared remarks that they pre prepared for me to close out tonight. But I, I, in listening, I've gotten motivated a little bit to just talk off, off, uh, off text. And um, one of the things that you said towards the end here um, about the AT is already a solution, Harvey, when you said that. And um, 
You also talked about passion, heart, and action, which, you know, so speaks to the the core ethic that is the Appalachian Trail and our cooperative management system built by volunteers, really delivered intact and whole to the people of, of the United States, right? I mean, we this was a gift to the National Park Service. The park didn't come, the government didn't come and find us. We created this entity, we as American citizens, and then gave it, which is one of the, the things that really caught my passion when I was young to get involved with the AT to begin with. It truly is a um, public-private partnership of what can happen when the best of both worlds of American citizens and its government come together and work towards a common good. I mean, and that's really why we've been so successful in creating what has become for people an icon. It's uh, for many people who hike it, it's a pilgrimage. It's so beyond. Um, and, and yet for some, it's still just, you know, a, a one hour day hike with their kids and their dog. It's, it's everything to everyone. It's available to millions of people. And so I have to be honest, as we were preparing for this discussion this evening, and we've been advertising it a lot through social media and online, um, I was really surprised at how many people, including really core people, people who are members of our organization, people who are donors, have really, like they had a very negative visceral response even to us bringing up this conversation and to having, um, fear that we're somehow losing sight of our mission and the core of what we do, right? Which is, is protecting the Appalachian Trail. And, you know, I, I think maybe because I live it and breathe it and I've been in this longer, I, I really do understand and I believe wholeheartedly that what we're doing is absolutely in direct service to that trail. And I think, you know, hopefully some of what you shared this evening can also help with some of that fear of, of the unknown fear. You know, I mean, it's hard for people to kind of, I think, come to grips with this idea that, as you said, Harvey, we're in dire straits here, you know, as a species, <laughs> you know. Um, but that doesn't mean that we can't act. And I guess, you know, to me, that's at the, also at the core of the AT. I mean, when Ben Mackay wrote that paper, who would think that you could actually put it on the ground, right? And you talk about back then, I mean, it was all private land, it was handshake deals, and it was a handful of people, uh, primarily Myra and Avery, who kind of, you know, took the action. There was the vision and took the action and then created that hope. And so to me, that's so much a part of who we are as an entity. I really do hope that those who are struggling with this conversation or with the idea that this is an important aspect for us to take on, will take this lesson and other things that we're doing through our, we're gonna continue with this education through our website and our weekly newsletters um, on our, um, all of our social media, we'll cover this. We'll have a future, um, these kinds of town halls, our AT Landscape Partnership is working and continuing to do work there. And we'll be sharing information with our members and supporters on all those successes. But um, yes. when we talk about the AT, while it's a, it's a physical entity, the one thing that really come, people come away with is the experience of the trail, right? It's not the nature itself, it's the experience that that nature brings. And that experience is what we need to, to protect for future generations. And that experience is what will be impacted through climate change if we do not do the work that we can do. And the fact that we've already accidentally created this spine that we now have the opportunity to build the body out further along is um, you know, nothing short of a miracle, quite frankly, when you consider where we are on the East Coast of the United States of America. And um, so it is, it's, it's our obligation as, as the conservancy to absolutely undertake this work. So I just want to take a few minutes there. And I don't know, Harvey, if you, there's anything else or Charlie. Well, you, you said something I think is really powerful. You know, there's only a few things in life that have multiple meanings. Like a car is a car, right? And, but sometimes a car is a status symbol. 
So it has two meanings. The Appalachian Trail is, an act, is a place, it's an activity, it's a symbol, it's a unifying thread, it's a success, and it's an opportunity. We don't have so many of those right now. So taking all of those magic ingredients and going, blowing some more life into it, more energy into it, is a magnet for hope. And it's not just a hope for the people who walk the trail or who are members of the Conservancy. Knowing it's there, it's called existence value, also matters to people. So you've got something really special that we all need right now in the world. And the more it's successful, the happier the rest of society will be. Yeah. I feel like that's a, a mic drop, Harvey. <laughs> Charlie? Uh, yeah, I just, the, the one thing I, I do want to give a shout out to those people who were worried about Harvey and me coming and talking about climate change, because Harvey and I live and work in the nonprofit world, and, and the, the prospect of mission creep is a really scary thing, and a legitimately so. Um, but I, I think I've got a, I think the best answer you could possibly give to why the ATC needs to start doing this. I, it's a simple thing. Just hand them a copy of Benton Mackay's 1921 paper. There's your answer. Yep. Yep. Talk about vision, right? All right, gentlemen. Well, stay safe, stay healthy. Hopefully we'll be at the end of our, our COVID tunnel at some point that we can um, meet together in person. And again, thank you so much for your time. I really, really appreciate it. I hope you all enjoy those forest spring trilliums in the bottom of the Appalachian Trail. We do. I live right. I can walk out my backyard and be on the trail in a few minutes. So it's pretty nice. Beautiful. Okay. Well, thank you, Sandy. Thanks to everyone at the Appalachian Trail Conservancy for the chance to be with you.